NTB Dialogues featuring Dr. Urvashi Singh, Professor in Charge of Tuberculosis Division of the Department of Microbiology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She is also the co-chair of Diagnostic Committee, National TB Elimination Program of India. She is a member of Diagnostic Committee, India TB Research Cons Consortium, Indian Council of Medical Research. And she is a member of the ICMR Task Force on Genital Tuberculosis. So as you see, she wears so many hats on her head at the same time, so many caps. Welcome, Urvashi. And uh, we are so happy to have you in our show today. And uh, he, today we are concentrating on tuberculosis also, and just diagnosis basically of tuberculosis. So can you tell our listeners what are the tools currently available in India to diagnose TB? Uh, thank you, uh, Shobhaji, Mr. Bobby, and the CNS for having me. Uh, I think it's uh, it's very nice to be able to talk to you. Basically, um, uh, you know, our uh, efforts here are to bring all the information regarding what all we are doing. And um, so the question that you asked was, what all is available to us? So traditionally, what has been done for TB diagnosis is smear microscopy using, you know, so... We have different staining methods, but we do microscopy on the sputum sample or extra pulmonary samples. The issue with microscopy is it needs more bacteria to be detected. So with time, we have newer methods, but of course, uh, you know, smear followed by culture. This was the gold standard method. It picks up fewer number of bacteria. We can pick up even 100 uh, TB bacteria per ml of sample by culture methods. And the culture methods earlier on were slow, but now we have uh, culture methods which can pick it up faster. We use liquid culture medium and automated systems to pick up. Hence, these are good methods and uh, continue to be the gold standards because the molecular methods, when they go faulty, we need to fall back on the culture-based phenotypic methods. So molecular methods are... You know, today's times with COVID having taught us so much, it's nothing but a polymerase chain reaction based, um, you know, applications. So different systems have a real time PCR based, uh, for example, there's closed systems like GeneX for MTB RIF. We have the TrueNAT system, both use real time PCR uh, with a little, little modification here and there. The advantage of molecular systems, not only these two, these are, like I said, closed systems. India has another, uh, ICMR is validated, a system by MyLab. So there are several systems available to us. WHO has now approved some moderately complex systems by, um, you know, by Beckton Dickinson, by Abbott, by Roche, another fourth one by Heinz. These are automated systems which can detect TB as well as drug resistance. Now, in the gene expert and TrueNAT systems, as of now, we were only, till now, we were only doing rifampicin resistance detection. Though today's time, we also need resistance to other drugs because we have regimen designed differently. So we are coming up with newer systems which tell us uh, resistance to <coughs> extended drugs, rifampicin, excuse me, <coughs> INH. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, <clears throat> and a few second line drugs as well, which are required for treatment of MDRTB. So there is, uh, you know, ample um, support from technical um, uh, backup, <clears throat> and we use it day in and day out to uh, help a patient's diagnosis. Now the WHO has called upon governments to replace microscopy completely with molecular tests. Yeah. So, uh, can you just explain a little bit more that how does molecular testing compare to microscopy in terms of early and accurate TB diagnosis? Yeah, so uh, like I said, um, mm. smear microscopy is an old test mm. and uh, the flaw with smear microscopy is only that it needs about 10 to about 3, that is 1,000 to 10,000 bacteria per mil of the sample, per milliliter of the sample. Now, <clears throat> often the disease can be in such a stage that these many number of bacteria are not present in the sample we collect. So smear microscopy loses in its sensitivity, analytical sensitivity. So what we call is limit of detection of smear microscopy is not as good while molecular methods 
pick up anywhere, uh, you know, close to a range of 20 bacteria to about 100 bacteria per milliliter of sample. That way we can pick up more patients and, uh, you know, the loss to diagnosis is much less. So these are much more sensitive, better limit of detection methods. And <clears throat> like I said, with advancing technology, we have been able to get the molecular methods to the peripheral centers as well. You know, we're working towards it. And India also has acquired several machines placed at peripheral centers for early, early diagnosis. Yeah. However, <clears throat> I'd like to differ when we talk about replacing smear microscopy. Smear microscopy does serve a good purpose, you know. <clears throat> as far as pulmonary tuberculosis is concerned, it is specifically picking a certain num number of patients. It is not really losing a lot as far as pulmonary TB is concerned. So in places where we are not able to equip with molecular method, you know, there are several developing countries where peripheral centers may not get a molecular method soon enough. Till such time, we can ensure the molecular method availability at the peripheral centers. Till such time, we can ensure that electricity, for example, in our remote villages, because most of these molecular methods run on a you know, system which needs electricity. So till we are well equipped to replace molecular, uh, replace microscopy, we should not really push it too hard. We should work on <clears throat> enabling our peripheral centers with molecular methods to enable them to diagnose early. Also, there's one more catch. Most of the molecular methods that are being used today are not picking non-tubercular mycobacteria. So in tropical countries, non-tubercular mycobacteria tend to infect post-TB. So it comes in as a, you know, a patient who's been treated for tuberculosis, has healed, may now get a non-tubercular mycobacterial infection. So unless the molecular methods we are offering are also poised to detect non-tubercular mycobacteria, till such time, we'll have to depend. So it's it's a work in progress. Everybody is working hard. Let's not talk of replacement just today. Also mm -hmm. about follow-up. So a patient is on treatment. So three factors, and like I said, you know, my where molecular cannot reach microscopy still works. Non-tubercular mycobacteria, till we can use molecular methods to tell us non-tubercular mycobacteria, they, they are important pathogens. They can also lead to mortality. Most often creep in after TB is treated. Thirdly, like I said, molecular methods are picking DNA in a patient, DNA of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now the DNA will be present even when the mycobacterium respond to treatment, that is they are dead because the patient is being treated. Hence, molecular methods detecting DNA cannot pick up patients who are responding to treatment. In fact, the, the guideline is such, the WHO recommends that a patient who's been treated within the last five years should not be diagnosed on gene expert alone or true not alone because the DNA may be present even after treatment. So prognostication, as we call it, prognosticating a patient DNA based on molecular methods are molecular method which are using DNA as a molecule are not really uh, you know useful. So there we can use microscopy. The moment the patient starts responding, the uh, smear microscopy tends to become negative. And that tells us that the patient is responding to the treatment. Okay, is uh, is there is this is a question which sometimes comes to me? Is there more uh, chance of a human error being involved in microscopy while doing human errors can be involved in any test? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in microscopy we have uh, you know so the test per se is very simple to perform mm -hmm. and the the uh, the microscopist will look for specific bacteria so it's it's very unlikely that it will be okay. false positively reported and we mm -hmm. have uh, you know better methods like we have the fluorescent staining method where again the, the the people are trained to do microscopy but this applies to molecular methods also you know mm -hmm. the training of the staff has to be there mm -hmm. they have to be able to process carefully they are trained to not carry over contaminating DNA from a, a, an earlier positive sample to a new negative sample. So training is part of the process and uh, we cannot really say one method needs more training than the other. They both have, uh, you know, their uh, uh, the training needs to be done. So an untrained person is never put on the job. It's always a trained person who takes care, yeah. Uh, how important is it to do drug sensitivity test or what we call DST 
before initiating TB treatment? Uh, should it be mandatory? And uh, of course, we are, is at least I generally hear about only rifampicin resistance being tested, if at all. Uh, is that enough? Yeah, so, that's a very good question. So let me come to the first part of your question. Yes. That is it important? It is very important because if we are treating, so in case we do not know that the patient is infected with a rifampicin resistant or what we call as MDRTB, yeah. because those who are resistant to rifampicin are most often resistant to INH as well. Mm. In 96% of the cases, rifampicin resistance comes in with INH resistance also. And the first line treatment that we use is, is based on rifampicin, mm -hmm. INH, ethambitol, and pyrazinamide. Now, mm -hmm. if we do not know that a patient has rifampicin resistant TB, we will be using the first line treatment. Mm -hmm. And that will only worsen the disease. It will, in fact, enhance the replication of the MDR organism. It is very important to know that the patient has resistance to the drugs that we are using. You know, the simile can be drawn with any other bacteria. We always yes. treat, say, even if it is a phylococcus infection or a UTI yes. because of uh, Escherichia coli, we treat based on the drug sensitivity profile. If we are using a drug which will not work, we are making the disease more complicated, more complex, difficult to treat. And in a disease like TB, we do not treat in time the patient, we can lose the patient. Mm -hmm. And worst of all, TB is a disease that is spread through the air. So the droplets, while a person speaks, get airborne. The droplets, once airborne, will dry and lose their water content. What becomes of the droplets is droplet nuclei. Now, the droplet nuclei are very light in weight and very small in size. So being light in weight, they flow with air currents flowing with air currents and they can impinge upon. So if I'm breathing in the air, which is rich in droplet nuclei, the nuclei are smaller than five microns. They'll go and impinge in my, you know, distal um, uh, part of the pulmonary, uh, you know, the respiratory uh, tract and can cause infection. So the bottom line I'm trying to come back to is, it is a disease transmitted through droplet nuclei, through air currents. And if a patient is not treated at you know, aptly and completely. So the right regimen has to be prescribed. A complete regimen has to be ensured. The patient should be treated with a complete duration of the regimen. If not, the patient may continue to shed bacteria and putting his, um, you know, community at risk at large. So all these factors are very important. We need to curtail transmission. First, we need to cure the patient in concern. We should give the best treatment possible. And we need to take care that he stops the transmitting. So we need to break these chains of transmission as early as possible. You said only rifampicin. I'm totally in agreement with you. We were only doing rifampicin because we were trying to diagnose MDRTB. And like I said, MD, rifampicin resistance in 96% also talks about INH resistance. Hence, we are treating MDRTB. So the treatment for MDRTB is different, clearly defined, available with National TB elimination program, it works very well. But when we are designing the MDR-TB regimen, so we try to give the best possible. You know, there, there's a lot of effort by the program, um, but our burden of TB is high. So we, so the MDR-TB regimen constitutes of, you know, seven different drugs and sometimes more. The shorter oral MDR regimen has seven drugs. The longer regimen, which we are slowly trying to, uh, you know, move back to the shorter regimen, because compliance with shorter regimen is always better. The patient gets, uh, you know, an intensive treatment and responds early, nine months treatment, and he's okay. So the drugs that are used during the MDR regimen, again, there can be resistance to those drugs as well. So unless we know at the baseline, whether the regimen, the treatment regimen we are prescribing to the patient is the optimal regimen, we may not be doing justice to the patient and the patient may not respond, may have issues, may have prolongation of disease and sometimes fail to the treatment we are giving. So it would be ideal that we know that the susceptibility profile to all the drugs we plan to put in the DR regimen. So, uh, and like I said, a lot of effort is going in that direction. We have phenotypic methods which are able to do uh, susceptibility testing to all the drugs we are using. But then, uh, you know, even despite using the liquid culture system, uh, we have uh, a loss in time in the sense the liquid culture will take about uh, a week to two weeks and, uh, you know, first to 
come as positive. And then we do the VST for uh, uh, this particular strain, which would entail another week to 10 days. So we may lose about two to three weeks. The molecular methods are now coming up. Like I said, the, even the newer machines or gene expert has come up with uh, an XDR cartridge, though the nomenclature is uh, slightly old. It, it follows the old XDR yes. definition. The current X definition is different. The TrueNAT has, has designed chips for, um, you know, fluoroquinolones, venicobiraculin, and uh, they also have chips for non-tubercular mycobacteria for INH. So INH and fluoroquinolone are two drugs we must know before we can put a patient on shorter oral drug regimen. So you very rightly pointed out it will be ideal to have complete DST profile to all the drugs we plan to use in our regimen. Okay, so uh, you mentioned and I that you said we are moving slowly to the shorter regimens. Why are we moving slowly to the shorter regimens? Why, so why I, not? Yes. Uh, so I didn't really mean slowly. I, may, I actually probably it must have come out that way. I meant shorter oral drug regimen will be the best option. But then mm -hmm. in patients in home, we cannot use drugs like INH. Uh, because there is uh, resistance to INH, especially high-dose INH. In patients we wear, there is fluoroquinolone resistance. We are not able to use shorter oral drug regimen because that these are essential components of the seven drugs which we use for shorter oral regimen. So we are kind of forced to use other than the shorter oral regimen. Now here, what is important is the relevance of uh, restricting over-the-counter availability of these drugs and misuse of drugs which are used, which are reserved for using in uh, MDRTV. That is something that needs to be driven aggressively, if I may kindly use the word, because fluoroquinolone resistance crops in because of prior usage by the patient or usage in the community. Mm -hmm. And fluoroquinolones are drugs which are very effective in a lot of other diseases. Hence, they are prescribed in several other diseases. Same like, as the story. I'm, I'm interrupting here, sorry. Like yeah. diseases like? So uh, fluoroquinolones are in fact, should not be, but are also used in pulmonary infections. You know, something like mm -hmm. um, even uh, people, um, uh, let me not, um, so they even use it for something as simple as a pharyngitis, a laryngitis. You see, in a, in a pneumonia, you would still think it is a Serious infection and the patient may get complicated if you're using such a drug for urinary tract infections. So these are being rampantly prescribed. And ideally, we should ensure that the drugs we have in such uh, difficult to treat uh, diseases. And these are some uh, drugs which are important for treating an MDRTV, for example. We should try and restrict uh, certain groups of drugs for uh, you know, the, the diseases with sinister outcomes. The, we may, you know, the mortality in these diseases can be very high and we have to depend on uh, important drugs. All right. So, in fact, I think we need to uh, sort of uh, strengthen our uh, basic systems uh, so, that, uh, so that we are able to test for these resistances and then put them on a shorter course. Because like to a lay person like me, I would uh, like we and even the community goes out or goes all out to have the shorter regimen because that will save a lot of trouble. Absolutely. More patient friendly. But as you said that you need to test the patient for resistance against those drugs which are being used in the shorter yeah. regimens. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so that uh, we so have, I think yes. there's a lot of effort from all over the country to mm -hmm. um, uh, reduce over-the-counter availability of all antibiotics for that matter. There's yes. a lot of push uh, for AMR um, uh, that, you know, only a doctor's prescription should uh, allow a chemist to dispense the drug. So there is a lot of effort, but like you said, you know, more needs to be done to ensure that we are able to get, give the best to, um, you know, patients who need the best. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, because the com general scenario is, Urbashi, that uh, for a common cold or some fever, like yeah. uh, persons like us, we just go buy some antibiotic. And I, I keep on telling my friends and my acquaintances that why are you going for an antibiotic? If it is not a bacterial infection, how is that going to help you? But that is as because it is sold over that counter. That's right. Yes. Uh, and, and uh, despite yeah. the fact that it, it, it is written Schedule H drug, 
but then the ease of availability yes you see yes. the ease of availability is is positive in some ways that yes uh, yes uh, you know in in a peripheral area where uh, you know a patient is unable to reach a doctor or um, though of course that is also changing with time you know there is ample um, effort to reduce that kind of an issue that availability of a medical professional to guide a patient so the the benefit is there where uh, you know easy availability could help a patient but then the rampant use and the yeah. rampant misuse yes. uh, should be stopped you know otherwise we'll be left uh, without any good drug yes exactly bacteria are very smart i only the other day i was teaching the undergraduates about the relevance of bacterial resistance mm -hmm. the bacteria has to survive yes. and it is smart it will find ways of uh, generating resistance mm -hmm. and the more the availability of the antibiotic to the bacterium the smarter it is in fact the dumping of extra antibiotics into landfills mm -hmm. makes the antibiotic available in sewage in water um, you know bodies mm -hmm. and the bacteria are smart they will generate resistance the moment they have uh, antibiotic available to them in sewages and in water bodies and so even those things need to be taken care of right at the public health level you know yes exactly you you are so very right there urvashi and in fact i had a question for you later on about how to curb antimicrobial antimicrobial resistance and you have spoken some right here about it uh, now when we are talking of peripheral systems uh, the existing diagnostic tests, we have the best of them. Uh, I, th I think TrueNAT is uh, one step ahead in the sense that it is battery operated, can be, I have seen it, it can be carried in a small suitcase and That's just right. run. So maybe that needs to be promoted more in places where we find more TB, where uh, uh, say a lab or a tertiary care or even a secondary state hospital is not easily available to the yeah. people. Yeah. So I think. Uh, so yeah, the, the, our effort from the beginning has been mm -hmm. to enable systems which can reach the patient. You know, right. mm -hmm. in fact, uh, a lot of drive uh, for uh, with the program. Uh, you know, uh, along with the other agencies supporting. We are trying to get uh, vans which will be equipped with X-ray and a mm -hmm. system, whether it is TrueNAT or a gene expert system. But like you rightly pointed out, a battery supported system will uh, overcome the need for electricity supplies to be there. Exactly. So there is, a, there is a lot of push. But like I said, you know, mm -hmm. the issues that we do face is um, one, of course, the large population to the high endemicity in our country. Mm -hmm. And three is hitch on the part of the patient. Mm -hmm. to not really reach the system. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we need to alter. We need to reach the patient, of course, but we also need to provide enough health education. The patient should be aware that he will be taken care of once he reaches the system. You know, the patients tend to ignore their complaints. So if I refer to the National TB Prevalence Survey, which was conducted by ICMR and NIRT and published in 2022, brought this out very beautifully that more than 60% patients ignored their systems. Igno ignore, they did not the think that a cough and cold. And so the, this is uh, a something that we must uh, acquaint our population that TB will present in a, in a very, um, you know, it will present as low grade fever, evening rise of fever. So the patient has enough energy in the morning. The patient will uh, like to work and go to work and will possibly think it is, um, you know, it is uh, uh, a weakness kind of a thing. They, they would describe their cough, their low-grade fever, and their protracted cough to maybe some viral illness. Or they would ignore it, thinking that their work will be compromised if they go to a hospital or to a, a medical center for care. That is the attitude we need to change. That is the attitude we need to, uh, we need to tell them to come to a medical center, be it, you know, so... Uh, the dot centers are, are ample in number. Here, I would bring in the problem of stigma with TB. So a lot of our community thinks if they're diagnosed with tuberculosis, they'll be stigmatized that, the, that their, their colleagues or their family would probably not, um, you know, not treat them well once they... But it is important for them to understand earlier the diagnosis is made, 
the better the treatment opportunity. The better the treatment would be. The treatment will ensure complete cure. Yes. If there's a delay in, in approaching the, uh, the hospital or a medical center, the delay can lead to, of course, the spread of the disease within the person. So the entries, like I probably I said in the beginning, it's always droplet nuclei, which we are inhaling in the air, you know, which may be coming from another patient who may have shed it unknowingly. So these patients who are not re reaching the system, do not know that they have TB, are not getting treated for TB, and they're continuing to disseminate the disease. Right. So a patient has to uh, be more, more uh, you know, vocal about his symptoms, not brush it under the carpet that this could be just a cough or following a viral, a protracted cough, low-grade fever, symptoms of tiredness, and so on and so forth should always be uh, brought to the notice of a medical person, medical care uh, specialist, anybody, you know, they should just reach the system, get themselves tested. What is more important is people who are old age, people who have comorbidities like diabetes. Mm -hmm. And again, coming back to prevalence survey, what they showed was patients who had, who were, uh, sm who had smoking history, who had alcoholic history. So these were few groups where tuberculosis was found in more numbers and they had not, you know, they did not seek medical guidance or diagnosis. So it is ideal for them to get themselves screened at least once in a year. One group that I did not mention till now and is a very important group is patients who are undernourished. So oh, undernourishment yes. Oh, yes. was associated in a big way in the prevalence survey. What we found was a lot of patients who were low uh, BMI had tuberculosis. So it would be ideal for them to get a screening. And of course, um, uh, for the system to support them. So a lot of TB patients we find uh, are having low BMI and the government has uh, started the direct benefit transfer and all that is taken care of. The, there are several programs with the National TB Elimination Program where they're trying to support the patients with nutrition as well. So there's a big drive towards that, but people should be aware if they are, uh, the low BMI is there and has been for a long time, possibly they can get themse themselves evaluated for TB. You know, and there is no shame in coming to the system. Mm -hmm. And like I said repeatedly, not to ignore the symptoms. Yes. Uh, Urvashi, on the ground, I have found, uh, like I have cough, say, for a prolonged period of time, or I have low-grade fever. Yeah. I, I would go to the nearest medical clinic. I have gone to some medical, my medical clinic. Right. But unless uh, the physician says you go for a TB test, the yeah. physician may give some medicines and that may continue. So I have seen in many cases uh, from personal experience that uh, the person has approached whatever uh, health facility was there closest to that person's house. Yeah. But still there is a long gap between uh, diagnosis and uh, his, his or her approaching the system. So Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. There may be... Um... You know, there's sometimes error at the, at the other end as well. But yes. uh, nevertheless, you know, um, uh, possibly if the if the symptoms continue, I would yes. say the patient should not ignore himself. Yes. Yes. You know, for his own sake, for his, the sake of his own family, his contacts yes. within the family, workplace, yes. the older people, you know, the, the parents or older people yes. living with the patient. So yes. it's it's like I said, these are the people who are at higher risk. Yeah. You know, the, the immediate contacts, the older people in contact. So if the symptoms continue and the symptoms do not resolve after the physician has uh, prescribed a yeah. treatment, please go back. Ask for, uh, you okay. know, maybe an x-ray, maybe a sputum examination. And like I said, you know, if you compare the uh, health systems abroad or in other countries, our country offers free treatment to uh, our patients, yeah. unless, you know, it is uh, in, a, in a private sector for a surgical this thing or something. Mm -hmm. So our government health system works in a very steady fashion and um, very committed physicians. So I would only say that the patient should approach the system again. Do not 
lose your faith in the system because everybody here is very committed to help uh, each and every patient. And in fact, uh, there is an effort at active case finding. So a lot of us are teaming up and uh, uh, enabling active case finding in slum areas. There have been studies which ICMR did in tribal areas and they found so many TB patients who were not even coming to the system. These patients were then linked to the National TB Elimination Program to the Dot Center. They were followed up, they were treated completely. So there is an effort for doing active case finding. We are not really waiting for the patient to come, mm -hmm. but it would be ideal that the patient should come so that the patient is not missed. Now, active case findings is being done in several pockets, slums, uh, you know, uh, old age homes and uh, these rent baseras and, uh, you know, night shelters. Yeah. But then it may not be practically possible for the system to cover all these uh, centers. So be it poor, be it rich, everybody should seek health care and the health system is, uh, you know, fully equipped to help out. And like I said, we're reaching the peripheral health centers. So the gene expert systems were bought more than 10 years ago and uh, disseminated throughout the country. Then TrueNet systems were bought. So the National TB Elimination Program is trying to equip mm -hmm. the peripheral centers as best as they can. But of course, uh, if the patient can reach the system, all the more better. Right, right. Yeah. That's a good message for, <laughs> for the people. Uh, Urvashi, all these uh, these molecular tests and the diagnostic tools we have talked about, they are based on sputum. That is, the sputum is tested. Now, uh, how does the quality of the sputum affect the test results? And some people find it difficult to produce sputum. Absolutely. Uh, so are there any non-sputum-based tests in the offing? Yeah. Uh, so let me, let me first uh, uh, offer okay. a little correction there. Uh -huh. So... Though in pulmonary TB, we will ask for sputum yes, to yes. be tested, but in, in, a, in a tertiary right. care center like ours, we are testing all kinds of extra pulmonary samples. Yes. Now, all kinds of extra pulmonary samples would include lymph node uh, aspirates. Mm -hmm. So a patient who has a lymph node uh, TB, uh, we will just do um, aspiration from the lymph node. We will test that with molecular methods and culture and microscopy, like I said. We test, uh, you know, Anything and everything. We test um, pleural fluid. We test uh, ascitic fluid. We test joint fluids. We test uh, in female genital TB. We also uh, take um, endometrial aspirate from a patient who's uh, suspected of, uh, who has presumptive female genital TB. We will take uh, endometrial aspirate and test that. So all these samples are collected, processed, tested. So we have all, all our techniques work on all these samples. So uh, CSF, CSF is a very good sample. And let me, uh, um, you know, take this opportunity to say, uh, which I did not really elaborate earlier, a person who does not get treated in time for pulmonary TB. Like I said, the only entry point in a body is through the air. Mm -hmm. Now, once the pulmonary TB sets in and the patient say tends to ignore it, maybe it was too short lived, this TB either can be controlled by the immune system in the body or may even lead to disseminated tuberculosis. Now, dissemination mm -hmm. of TB can involve any, any organ of the body, practically any organ of the body. So if the TB goes to the central nervous system, this is one organ or one or, uh, area where treatment can be very difficult or prolonged because the, the antitubercular drugs may not reach in time, reach an adequate amount mm -hmm. in the CSF. Mm -hmm. And we have a very high mortality. We have a mortality to the tune of 30% in the case of TB meningitis. Mm -hmm. So the message to the, pub, the community should be come to the system early. Do not let the disease get florid. You know, we don't want to lose these patients. They, and this is a completely treatable disease, you know, as against a few other diseases where complete treatment is not possible. We can completely treat them. But if the disease gets too florid, becomes uh, disseminated and was the CNS, we can have mortality due to tuberculosis. So I coming back to what you asked that the molecular methods can detect. So we are equipped to detect all kinds of TB, only rare forms where it is difficult to get a sample from. For example, there's a deep seated infection and we can't reach it. For example, there's something in the spine which is difficult to tap the sample. 
or sometimes even if, for example, we're taking an aspirate from a lymph node and we're not getting an adequate yield, an adequate sample, a joint fluid, we may not always get a sample which is representative of the pathology that is there, which as is understandable is a difficult to reach site. We have certain techniques, certain um, uh, tests available to us now. So for example, we have the antigen tests as is used, you know, even in dengue, we use the NS1 antigen test for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So for TB, we have something called as liporabinomannan, which is a part of the cell wall of the TB bacillus. Mm -hmm. And this is present in practically all uh, samples in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be detected in sputum, it can be detected in serum, it can be detected in urine, it mm -hmm. can be detected in CSF. Mm -hmm. Now, the beauty of this antigen is it gets, so once the bacterium is broken down by our immune system, by our macrophages, the, the uh, antigen of the bacterium can be filtered out. It's a small antigen, so it can be filtered out and is in fact concentrated in the urine. So urine is a very good sample, especially in, so a lot of published work you will see is available in uh, people living with HIV. Yes, yes. Those who get tuberculosis disease, we can use Urine lamp detection, which is a lateral flow assay, very easy to do, can be done at the periphery also. And in PLHIV, we can diagnose TB with LAM. LAM is a very highly specific test. The specificity is very high. So if it gives a positive, it is definite TB. If it gives a negative, we can you know further uh, do other tests because the sensitivity may not be very nice, very high. Sensitivity is in the tune of 60 to 70 percent, while specificity is more than 90, 95 percent. So this is one antigen test. And let me also share with you, a lot of literature came in between the year 2013 onwards from the, uh, the Western world in PLHIV with TB. And we tested, we were probably the first group who tested it in um, pediatric population and small children. Mm -hmm. We did the study in the year 16 to 19, and we published in 2019 that we this test, the urine lamb test, was in fact more sensitive in children with tuberculosis than gene expert. You know, gene expert in children can have issues. I'll come to that shortly. What I'm trying to, the message that I'm trying to give is the lamb test, the urine lamb test, uh, which is being made by two makers now. The Abbott has taken over the Elia lamb and the Fuji lamb is another very sensitive method. And we have some third generation uh, tests coming up. It can pick up with high specificity. So a positive is definitely TB. A negative needs to be investigated further if clinical suspicion of TB is there. So coming back to my point, in, um, uh, children with TB can have two kinds of presentation. Either they will have the lung parenchyma involvement, mm -hmm. where detecting um, uh, TB from their respiratory samples, where we can take gastric aspirates. Mm -hmm. And you earlier asked what other than sputums, we can also have induced sputum. We nebulize okay. the child and we use inducing of sputum and also in adult patients okay. who are not able to bring out sputum on their own. We induce mm -hmm. the sputum using nebulizing or even steam inhalation at home right. can mm -hmm. facilitate bringing out uh, a sputum. So patients, uh, children who have parenchyma, lung parenchyma is the lung tissue involvement, will uh, be able to, uh, you know, bring out a uh, sputum or during uh, when we perform a gastric aspirate, we'll have a sample of the sputum they ingested. We take it out from the stomach. These can be good samples for a gene expert to detect TB. Mm -hmm. But say in case this child who... So like I'm repeatedly saying, he inhaled, got parenchymal yes. TB, parenchymal involvement, but the immune system tends to repair. So the parenchymal involvement got repaired and the child still has TB in his media sinal lymph nodes. In such children, we, we give it the term intrathoracic TB mm -hmm. to cover both uh, parenchymal and media sinal TB. The sputum or the gastric aspirate may not be detected by gene expert. So the gene expert or TrueNet or even culture method, which I say, uh, mm -hmm. is the gold standard, may not be able to pick up TB in patients where the, the lesion has been walled off. Here, tests where antigen detection like LAM in the mm -hmm. urine can serve as a, a very useful mm -hmm. test. Okay. Yeah. So, so LAM should not be used more because uh, sputum always, even in the general public, but LAM is generally used uh, for children What from what I have read and for HIV, uh, uh, people living with HIV. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it so, is not... um, yeah. so you see this when this test came up, it was initially used in PLHIV. Yes. So recommendations came for PLHIV because they actually showed the shortening of diagnosis by the use of LAM, in fact, mm -hmm. reduced the mortality in PLHIV with TB. Mm -hmm. Now, as evidence keeps coming in, people tend to use it or once recommendations come in. So first the evidence has to come in, yes. then the recommendations have to come in, then only people will use. So we have some ongoing work in extra pulmonary TB as well. Mm -hmm. Like I said, uh, we did a study recently, one of my MD students concluded that we tested LAM in CSF, in TB meningitis, and we in parallel did LAM in urine in these patients. So urine LAM was in fact better than CSF LAM okay. because it tends to get filtered out or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we have been able to use urine lab in patients who have TB meningitis. And like I'm repeatedly saying, specificity is very high. Sensitivity okay. may not be uh, up to the mark. We may miss a few patients, but then if our doubt or, uh, you know, our um, uh, this thing of presumptive TB is clinical uh, suspicion of presumptive TB is still there, we can still continue to investigate the patient till we are sure of the diagnosis. So it is a good test. Now, like I said, as evidence comes in, more and more people use it. We have shown evidence of extra pulmonary TB. We've also done a lymph node TB. Uh, lab is picking the patients, you know. So this was compared to gold standard diagnosis. It was doing very well. Okay. Great. But for now, we do not have the availability. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not really available. Uh, mm -hmm. Fuji Lab had brought it in, but they're, they're probably uh, increasing the number of factories, mm -hmm. still improvising. Mm -hmm. Abbott is also still improvising, and we have some... Um, so it is, I think, undergoing BCGI approval for uh, use in PLHIV, though the NACO has recommended it. So we hope to have them soon. And like I said, the third generation lamb will also be available soon. So we should be able to put them to use. Yes. All right. You are part of genital TB ICMR task force. Is genital TB less understood as compared to TB of other parts of the body? Uh, means not pulmonary, but when even when we are talking of extra pulmonary TB in our country. And uh, how difficult is it to detect genital TB or other forms of extra pulmonary TB? So we've had um, a lot of studies. In fact, I would say for 20 years, different, um, uh, so gynecologists have been working with different yes. groups, you know, very esteemed gynecologists, Dr. Kriplani, uh, Dr. Nina Malhotra, Dr. J.V. Sharma, and, uh, you know, several groups we've been working and what we've been trying to uh, really do is so so coming back to your first part of the question is it difficult uh, to diagnose as compared to other extra pulmonary disease mm -hmm. extra pulmonary tb mm -hmm. now the in other extra pulmonary tb the patient would be having some symptoms or, or would have a florid presentation in female genital tb the patient will probably only come to us when the patient is not conceiving so yes. like sure. i said the entry for, for you know, for the TB bacilli, it gained entry through the uh, respiratory tract, had a pathology in the lung, which at that point was possibly ignored, and the the TB bacilli spread, and female genital uh, area is one uh, place where it will <clears throat> go and possibly not cause a florid uh, disease. You know, sometimes the patients do come with <laughs> symptoms other than infertility, but most often we diagnose uh, patients who come to us with infertility. Mm -hmm. Other uh, times the patient could come with issues like, uh, uh, you know, their the problem with the menstruation and so on and so forth, loss of weight and uh, similarly gynecological problems. What we do is we take an endometrial aspirate or an endometrial biopsy and we diagnose using our, our culture methods and molecular methods. Uh, we detect uh, TB bacilli and we prescribe treatment. And most of these patients with infertility, unless they are they are florid and there is disease has led to fibrosis and uh, the, over, the fallopian tubes are now closed because of fibrosis. Unless the disease has progressed, these patients will respond and they conceive mm -hmm. and they have children and, uh, you know. So the earlier they come to the system, mm -hmm. it is always better. And like I'm saying, uh, healthcare here does not uh, cost them uh, much. They reach a government hospital, they get the best of, they get the best of care and uh, yeah, we're able to help them. All right. So uh, as of now, what are the best tests to diagnose extra pulmonary TB early? You have mentioned the LAM test that uh, it uh, has helped you. 
So that's a mm. non-invasive method for that's infection mm. from urine. Mm. But mm. like I said, sensitivity is one uh, issue mm. where we may not be able to utilize mm. its, uh, mm. you know, its high specificity in all samples. Mm. So we are primarily depending on molecular methods. So mm. molecular methods, um, you know, a lot of groups have published and we have published in 2013, uh, uh, gene, um, um, WHO gave a recommendation for use of gene expert in extrapulmonary samples, especially CSF. The sensitivity of gene expert in other extrapulmonary samples can sometimes be less. Mm -hmm. Again, the reason, so molecular methods are not uh, really um, um, foolproof, if mm -hmm. I may use that word. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. can be issues with inhibitors in extrapulmonary samples. So if we're using a pleural fluid, for example. Now, pleural fluid is a sample which is very high, highly rich in protein, which can cause inhibition of the PCR. Now, PCR is a molecular uh, test which is dependent on enzymes. Enzymes amplify the uh, DNA of okay. microbial tuberculosis. Now, if these enzymes are inhibited because of inhibitors, so-called inhibitors, like I said, um, you know, the clotting cycle, the coagulation factors, high protein, hemoglobin in a, in a blood, uh, you know, in a sample when, when during collection, it can have too much of blood. These things can cause inhibition of all molecular tests, not gene expert alone. Mm -hmm. So though uh, WHO gave a recommend, uh, recommendation in 2013, we were part of the evidence that time. And uh, subsequently, we've also um, uh, worked on uh, TrueNet in extrapulmonary samples, and it worked beautifully, as well as gene expert. So all the molecular methods do come to our aid. Mm -hmm. And like I said, when we miss using any of these methods, and we continue to have the doubt, we depend on other methods, like culture is very good, but again, extrapulmonary samples have possibacillary disease. So the number of bacteria are fewer in extrapulmonary disease. So sometimes culture may also act tricky. We may not always be able to pick it up, but yes, we do try to uh, use all of these and they're uh, very, very helpful techniques. All right. Uh, I just read the uh, WHO has just published recommendations on the use of what they call targeted next generation sequencing tests uh, for rapid deta detection of drug resistance to the new anti-TB drugs. Uh, are these tests based on, uh, are they the same as genome uh, uh, sequencing They're tests? All, yeah. So um, you see, when we're talking of drug resistance to um, any antibiotic, mm -hmm. And here, since we're only talking about anti-tubicular drugs, mm -hmm. we have agents which we use as a first-line drugs. We have agents we, as which we use as the second-line drugs. Mm -hmm. Now, resistance to these, like I said, the bacteria is very smart. What it does is it brings in one single nucleotide polymorphism. We call it a mutation, SNP or a mutation, yes. and changes the target where the drug is going to go and bind. Mm -hmm. So the drug is unable to bind, and there is resistance that creeps in. Mm -hmm. So why I bring this here is if we detect this mutation, which is responsible for drug resistance, we can very easily say that this particular drug will not work. There is resistance to this drug. Now, how do we detect these mutations? There are several methods. Like we were detecting rifampicin and INH by gene expert or TrueNAN. They also use the same principle. They use real-time PCR to detect these mutations. You know, individual mutations which are known to be responsible for drug resistance to these particular drugs. Now, with the available um, uh, you know, enhancement or increased knowledge, improved technology. We are able to also do whole genome sequencing. Mm -hmm. And the whole genome sequencing will tell us the complete genome of an organism. Mm -hmm. We do something, uh, you know, to help us detect drug resistance. We do something called as targeted NGS, targeted mm -hmm. next generation sequencing, where mm -hmm. just to simplify, we are amplifying the genes where known mutations to the drugs are present. We amplify those genes by PCR and we sequence these genes. We're not sequencing the whole genome like we do in whole genome sequencing. We're doing in target next generation sequencing only targeted amplification of genes where mutations to drug uh, resistance are present. We amplify these genes and we look for these mutations either by sequencing or short of that, like I said, uh, the uh, even the uh, closed systems are coming up. W uh, Gene Expert has come up with uh, Gene Expert XTR. WHO has recommended, uh, uh, like I said, Abbott, um, Roche, Heinz, mm -hmm. and um, uh, Beckton Dickinson system, which are getting equipped to look at the second line resistance as well. For now, they're offering INH and fluoroquinolone, but they will soon be able. 
targeted NGS tells us we can look at bidacular mutation, we can look at delaminid resistant, linezolid resistant, or the drugs we use for treating tuberculosis. So that is how targeted NGS can help us. And we have a catalog of mutations by WHO. In India, okay. NIRT has come out with a catalog of mutations prevalent in India. And we, um, as long back as 2003, 2004, we sequenced countrywide isolates and uh, shared the mutations prevalent throughout the country. Northern region had different isolates, genotypes, different genotypes of TB, southern had different. So there is ample data available to tell us which mutations will be responsible for drug resistance. We just need to equip uh, our countrywide to be able to use the targeted NGS better. Right, right. So do you see this uh, targeted or whole genome sequencing as the future of DST? Absolutely. So, yeah. So, you know, this was, um, so we have been working on, so first uh, I will answer the question directly and then take it mm -hmm. to how the country is getting equipped. Mm -hmm. So the, the, like I said, we pick up these targets because we know these targets mm -hmm. will tell us this particular drug is useless. We should not be using in the, uh, the uh, treatment regimen. Mm -hmm. So it is something which can once scaled up, and available to each and every patient for the country can actually help us design what we call as individualized treatment for each patient or tailor-made treatment, which is the ideal. Like I was giving a simile of other bacteria earlier. So as early as 2013, we started working on getting um, sequencers for the country. So uh, in 2018, you know, the process went on and we were able to procure uh, sequencing systems for six sites the national reference laboratories in the country, they are equipped and they are capable of doing it. We need to, uh, you know, further simplify with COVID teaching us so many lessons during, uh, you know, 19 to 23. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is a lot more uh, molecular depend I mean, dependence or, uh, you know, confidence on molecular methods. We should be able to equip uh, countrywide uh, with this NGS method. So we'll be able to design. You have been involved with TB vaccine research too. Right. Yeah. What does the future pipeline look like for yeah. a new safe and effective TB vaccine? Yeah. And are there any clinical studies going on in India also? Yes. So, yeah. So, you know, vaccine is one short, short way of um, ensuring that either the infection does not occur or the disease does not occur or relapse mm -hmm. does not occur. So we have vaccines yes. which take care of. So prevention of infection vaccine, prevention of disease vaccine, prevention mm -hmm. of relapse vaccines. Uh, so ideal would be a vaccine which gives us prevention of infection. Mm -hmm. Now, we have the BCG vaccine, which you know is recommended for all children at mm -hmm. zero day, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, very rightly so, because this vaccine will, uh, you know, safeguard against disseminated TB in small children in a high endemicity country like ours mm -hmm. and in uh, protection against meningeal TB. So sinister TB, it does protect against. The issue is that the protection wanes off by the time of adolescence or adulthood. So BCG vaccine continues to give the protection and we've seen uh, that. And let me first complete about the BCG yes. vaccine. So we had some large trials globally. And uh, incidentally, the trial which was done in Chingalput in India, there was a supposed trial in the North as well around that time, which did not happen. But the Chingalput trial did not report protection mm -hmm. when the reports came out. And the, the, the absence of protection was ascribed to prior exposure to non-tubercular mycobacteria, which if you remember, I mentioned in the beginning, yes. all the tropical and the uh, temperate zones tend to have non-tubercular mycobacteria. So there were several reasons given why BCG uh, was not very highly protective, but we continue to use the BCG, like I said, in our children, mm -hmm. it protects against uh, you know disease that would kill uh, neurological, disseminated and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, recently, uh, there was a relook at the Chingalput data, and what the NIRT published was there was 36% protection mm -hmm. by BCG. So we have ample evidence to continue to use BCG till such time we have a better vaccine available. Mm -hmm. Then there was an article um, in NEJM, New England Journal of Medicine, the, uh, the topmost quoted journal, uh, where they did a study in South Africa. They used two vaccines. And there also, BCG showed 45.4% protection. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, uh, the bottom line I'm coming to is, 
a lot of countries are using BCG revaccination as well. So uh, BCG vaccine is given at the baseline at the zero day, mm -hmm. and the children or the adolescents were giving given BCG revaccination as well. Mm -hmm. Especially in the Europe, several countries were doing this. So our country has now taken this up BCG revaccination in certain districts, and this is one trial which is going on. Mm -hmm. We initiated a trial in the year 2018 where we used a vaccine manufactured in India, which was based on uh, Mycobacterium indicus pronae or the MIP vaccine. Mm -hmm. And we also had uh, a vaccine where a modified BCG was being used. This was a trial which was again, so this was uh, the trial idea was initiated at AIMS. And since we wanted to take it countrywide, ICMR took the lead. Mm -hmm. And we had eight sites involved, eight sites across the country where um, a tertiary center, a peripheral center, a district center, we, they were all taken. So uh, this trial has, is just concluding, uh, uh, in fact, end of this month, and we okay. will soon have that data. Oh, right. uh, in addition, there have been trials in the country where prevention of relapse vaccine has been tried. Um, uh, Serum Institute of India was manufacturing the modified BCG, Kaufman's vaccine, and that was being tried as prevention of relapse vaccine. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, and in fact, the ICMR is probably considering uh, the M72 molecule also. Uh, which showed mm -hmm. about, uh, for you know, slightly less than 50% protection, again, an article published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So there is a lot of effort to look at vaccines which can give us protection. So prevention of infection, like I said, would be the ideal. But yes, um, till, we, till such time we reach the ideal, we are trying our uh, best to look at these vaccines which can give us, uh, you know, protection from disease. Infection happens. But disease does not happen, and uh, if treated, the patient should not relapse because often past treatment, past tuberculosis, can make uh, things difficult for a patient. You know, if he's not taken complete treatment, he can get a, get a relapse, and then treating a relapse can be tricky because sometimes the relapse may be uh, due to a resistant organism. So, you know, it's difficult for the patient and difficult for the doctor as well to ensure complete treatment and uh, cure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, while the TB vaccine research goes on yeah. uh, and we get the holy grail at the end, someday we should yeah. be getting it, yeah. what else can be done to prevent TB transmission? What are your insights on that? Please. So, that's a wonderful question. And um, let me come back to what I've been saying. Yes. That the transmission is occurring from a patient who does not know that he has TB. So we sometimes ascribe a term called subclinical TB to such a patient who is asymptomatic, but he has TB and he's shedding the TB disease, shedding the TB bacteria in the environment. He's unaware, he's not gone to the system, he's not been put on treatment. So the first and the foremost thing I would say is people should become conscious about the basic uh, pathology and pathogenesis of the disease or how each and every one of us, now rich are not uh, 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 safe or the poor are not safe. Mm -hmm. It is an airborne infection. For example, like I always talk about the polio detected in New York water supply. I mean, an advanced country who screens their sewage and water uh, for any communicable disease, if they could detect. So this is something, things which are spread through air or spread through water, nobody is safe. So. What we have to ensure is that a person himself is not diseased. If there are any symptoms, go get screened, diagnosed, treated, which is most important. Do not ignore your health. And the health system is here to help you with early diagnosis. Nobody will refuse, will turn you away. They will try and help you. So first is the subclinical TB needs to be diagnosed. So a lot of the, in the prevalence survey, they picked up a lot of these patients who were not symptomatic but had, uh, you know, we were diagnosed as TB. Mm -hmm. So first is this, that not to ignore your symptoms, health awareness, health education to the whole community. Everybody mm -hmm. should feel free to come up with their symptoms and get diagnosed. Number two is taking care of nutrition. Like I said, the groups which are found in prevalence survey to have more disease mm -hmm. were older age group. And the other day in a meeting, one of our very senior teachers was pointing out that the, in the older age group, Sometimes it is difficult for them to reach the system. 
uh, because of constraints uh, relating to their transport, their, uh, you know, if they can, uh, they need help and things like that. So the, we are trying to equip the system to reach such patients, but older age group, diabetics, people who are smokers, who are alcoholics may have higher chances. So all the more reason get a regular screening, maybe an annual screening, right? Malnourished people should take care of their nutrition. Uh, so there was this ration study which got yes, published yes. in Lancet, Dr. Mm -hmm. Narag mm -hmm. study. And uh, uh, so no, not only there's Dr. Heyman's study from NIRT, we have done a study in Ames, in Balabgarh, which is our, our outreach center. Dr. Rakesh has done, uh, was leading the study, where we have given energy-dense nutrition supplement to our patients. So ration study has gotten published, which showed us that more than, you know, 30% uh, patients were, be were not really patients, the household contacts were benefited and did not progress to disease because there was nutrition given to them, uh, you know, calories as well as protein. So sometimes people think, you know, uh, calories alone is enough. Mm -hmm. What we need to also um, emphasize is proteins as a component of diet and micronutrients as well need to be ensured in the diet. Those who are low BMI, uh, like I said, should get screened for any such disease which may be incidental because of their poor BMI and their poor immune response, which the poor BMI leads to. And they should work towards improving their uh, nutritional status. And there's a big push uh, from uh, uh, several ends. We are also working to do active case finding and give nutrition to slum population. Uh, so we diagnose TB early, try to supplement their nutrition, and support them in all possible ways. So there is a drive from the health system side, but if the patient does take care of uh, himself and his family, he's contributing to the community's welfare. Right, so, right, yeah. right. Uh, Urvashi, you have spoken about this earlier, about uh, bacteria becoming resistant and finding novel ways. So, but can you just uh, summarize that once again, that what can be done to prevent TB bacteria from becoming resistant to the new TB drugs and also uh, for other types of diseases, the bacteria becoming resistant to, to somehow control or curb antimicrobial resistance as we call it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, let me first talk about TB and I'll talk about yes. the other bacteria. So I yes. think the, the, the uh, oversimplifying the problem, bacteria have to be harmful pathogenic bacteria, not the commensal and yes. the, uh, the good bacteria in mm -hmm. our system, mm -hmm. need to be removed as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Why I say that is the more the number of bacteria, for example, if a person gets infected with TB, ignores his health, there is a cavity formation in the lung, there is a number of bacteria go on increasing because there's replication of bacteria happening, the bacteria is smart, needs to survive. Mm -hmm. Now, the more the number of bacteria, the more are the chances that it will be drug resistant because it goes on replicating and every replication. So this is something I teach to my undergraduate students. Every rep replication will bring in, uh, you know, several mutations because the replication can be yes. faulty and mutations will creep into the, into the genome. Some of these mutations are, are capable of offering resistance to a drug. So the more the number of bacteria, we need, uh, you know, they will be more capable of generating drug resistance. So it is, that is why I repeatedly am saying early diagnosis and early treatment are the crux of the problem. So we need to reach the system. The system needs to give the right treatment to us. When you talked about the other drugs, so uh, if you, uh, so we use terms like primary MDR and acquired MDR. Primary MDR is yes. when one gets infected with an MDR organism and acquired MDR is when while on treatment or in past treatment, the person gets, uh, uh, you know, resistance. So acquired resistance can often occur because of poor prescription if a medical person or a, maybe an underqualified person, which uh, we try not to, you know, to restrict such practices, but is prescribing single drug, two drugs, drugs in low dosages. So the bacteria needs a certain amount of drug to kill it if the drug is being prescribed at low dosages for the body. That is why we have you know, um, uh, uh, weight-based uh, recommendation for drug regimen. Mm -hmm. So the right amount of drug, the right combination of drug needs to be given only the bacteria, only then the bacteria will get killed. If you're giving one drug, the bacteria which is resistant to one, that particular drug will now amplify 
and will be more will be stronger with resistance. So poor prescriptions, poor compliance on part of the patient. Sometimes the patients don't feel very good after taking an antibiotic, which can be possible due to a side effect of the antibiotic. So they need to approach the doctor, come back to the doctor. Okay, this drug is giving me these side effects. Can you suggest me something else? We often get, um, you know, liver uh, issues uh, yeah, sometimes, but the doctors have an answer for that. They should come back to the doctor and not lose faith in the doctor, but also contribute by taking the uh, prescribed regimen in the complete dosage for the complete yes. duration. If they don't do that, they are only enhancing the drug resistance and making things worse for themselves. And like I said, they'll continue to disseminate the disease, making things difficult for the community. So all these, and like I addressed earlier, over-the-counter availability of antibiotics without prescriptions and uh, so, so on and so forth. I also mentioned about, uh, you know, a wrong disposal of these antibiotics in, uh, you know, in uh, landfills and they are, pro they are there in the water systems where a lot of bacteria can, um, so you've heard of this, um, uh, when um, the nomenclature, New Delhi, um, um, so basically what I'm trying to say is a lot of, uh, so this applies to other bacteria, especially. We have plasmids which carry bacterial resistance genes, which can transfer be between bacteria, not described in TB. TB, there is no horizontal gene transfer described, but in Escherichia coli and other bacteria, horizontal gene trans um, uh, transfer of plasmid which carry drug resistance genes is known. This can happen very easily in water bodies and sewages. So there was this New Delhi, the NDM1 was described and given the name New Delhi, which all of us objected, but it's still can. So that was nothing but a plasmid, which is prevalent in the Asian continent, in Indian mm -hmm. subcontinent, even in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. In China, we have something as KPC. And KPC has also been found in US because of the travel from here. So all this is, this is where the one health concept uh, comes in. The misuse of antibiotics used for, for example, cholestin, which is, I've, I've now moved away from TB and to, uh, answering your second question in other yes, bacteria. Yes. Yes. So one health concept ensure, is, is trying to ensure misuse of antibiotics in other than humans. So our um, agriculture, we use, uh, you know, we tend to use antibiotics, in fact, uh, in a microbiologist community, we were having a big discussion about, you know, these are available on Amazon. Antibiotics mm -hmm. in big sacks are available uh, online. And then misuse of antibiotics in poultry in our, um, you know, uh, in fact, this is a question I asked um, um, uh, a team which came from the U.S., uh, one of the universities. I asked them, are you able to take care of misuse of antibiotics in agriculture and animals? So they said, no, they're not able to. So the AMR is not being generated by misuse in, in humans or by doctors alone. Mm -hmm. There is a bigger picture to it. So we need to address it in, in total. And there is a lot of push globally to in that direction. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And now we will end with your message for World TB Day, which is just very close. What is your message? So um, I, I think I'll, possi I'll possibly be repeating uh, what I said yes, earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, despite our efforts to, to, you know, to best diagnose and offer the best treatment, um, diagnose all kinds of drug resistances early, and offer the best of treatment, unless the patients and the community become aware that there is no stigma. There is, you know, why worry about anybody stigmatizing you? So I, I think the, the health education and knowledge about this being a completely treatable disease, if there's a delay in treatment, it may be difficult to treat the disease or the treatment may be prolonged because the drug resistance may creep in. So I only want to convey to our uh, our people that if there are any symptoms, you should you should seek care, and uh, do not um, you know hide behind your symptoms or or ascribe them to some uh, simple ailment like post viral or viral. Please seek diagnosis and seek treatment if required. And not just sit back. And those who have comorbidities or those who have, say, older age group and they have such symptoms, please seek health care. Those who are undernourished, improve the, uh, you know, your BMI by improving nutrition, the right nutrition. One more message that I don't think I mentioned was there has been evidence 
So one reason that has not been covered a lot is higher burden of intestinal parasites in certain populations. For example, in our uh, you know developing world, of course, uh, due to possibly due to uh, you know sources like soil uh, or water, and also the personal hygienic techniques, intestinal helminths. There have been papers over the past twenty plus years which clearly show. Uh, predispose a person to diseases like TB, even to diseases like, you know, HIV is, of course, uh, 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 encountered uh, and we are aware of the, um, uh, the uh, how they, that is uh, acquired. But intestinal helminths can predispose. So, uh, like, uh, in, during COVID also, we ensured hygienic practices. So, TB is nothing but a slow COVID. Again, that is another message. So like we were afraid of COVID, oh, by inhaling, we'll get TB. Please be aware that you can get TB by inhaling. Only difference is TB progresses slowly and COVID was progressing faster. So we must, um, you know, uh, this is talking about parasites. We must uh, adopt hygiene in all our uh, ways, you know, hygiene, uh, hygienic air or environment, air pollution we know is, uh, is a deterrent. We should take care of, uh, uh, you know, ingesting hygienic water, food, and those who have parasitosis or who have symptoms of um, parasite uh, should, again, seek health care and uh, get treated. Uh, even in China, there is a lot of intestinal uh, helmet burden, which possibly can be predisposing these populations. So all the, so if you see the high burden countries are all developing countries. So one is, of course, there, uh, like like they said, once industrial revolution came in, the when the TB in the West got the problem of TB in the West got solved, which I'm sure we will also reach. But the what is the crux of all these? There is undernutrition. There is high parasitic load. These are the things that the patients themselves can take care of. And the more they are aware, the more they will approach the healthcare, and uh, will be taken care of. So I think these are the. So I would urge more and more people to approach the healthcare system seek um, answers and practice healthy habits, clean habits for their own health and their family's health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Urvashi, for clarifying so many of our doubts and for simplifying for our listeners the complexities of scientific tools for diagnosing TB. Friends, we were listening to Dr. Urvashi Singh, Professor in Charge of Tuberculosis Division of the Department of Microbiology, all India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.